of the NMJ as we see it under the electron microscope. So this is not a physical communication between the nerve ending and the muscle ending. There is a gap in between these two and on the nerve side there is release of the acetylcholine and this acetylcholine is packed into small uh, packets which are called as quanta or vesicles. Each quanta is about 50 nanometers in size and each quanta contains about 5000 acetylcholine molecules. Now you see that the size of this quanta is about 50 nanometers in size and the distance between the nerve ending and the synaptic cleft is also 50 nanometers. So these quanta don't have to travel a lot to be in communication with the acetylcholine receptors which are found in clusters. And if you look at the structure of the sarcolemma, then it is a folded structure with multiple serrations, grooves and furrows on which the acetylcholine receptors are found in uh, clusters. And this cleft in itself is about 50 to 100 nanometers in size. Now, what happens is that there is release of these acetylcholine molecules as soon as these quanta or these vesicles, they come in contact with the edge of the synaptic cleft and these acetylcholine molecules, they come in contact with the acetylcholine receptors, which are on the sarcolemmal side of the muscle fiber. So if we understand what is going on at the nerve ending, then you know that the impulse, it arrives from the brain and by the means of solitary conduction and by the use of sodium potassium ATPase pump, this uh, uh, signal, it tends to reach up to the nerve ending. And when it reaches the nerve ending, there is opening up of these calcium channels. There is an influx of calcium and this influx by using the ATP as an energy source forces these acetylcholine vesicles to bind with the edge of the nerve terminal and release these acetylcholine. Now, as the acetylcholine is released, it binds to the acetylcholine receptors and results in opening up of the sodium potassium channels, which are the channels which are inside the acetylcholine uh, receptor uh, complex and the remaining acetylcholine is degraded by acetylcholine esterase into choline molecules. This choline molecule is again actively re into the nerve terminal. It binds with coenzyme A in the presence of an enzyme choline acyl transferase to form acetylcholine which is again taken up in these vesicles and this cycle it tends to continue. So this is in short what is actually going on neurophysiologically at the edge in the neuromuscular junction. Now when these sodium and potassium channels open there is an influx of the sodium and the end plate potential which is the basic potential at the neuromuscular junction it becomes more negative and it incites what we call as the action potential which causes the muscle fibers to contract so this is in nutshell and in extreme brief what is happening at the neuromuscular junction so in myasthenia gravis, about 80 to 85 percent of patients would have anti-acetylcholine receptor antibodies positive. The reduction in the number of acetylcholine receptors is by three different mechanisms. There is a complex complement mediated damage to the postsynaptic membrane. There is an accelerated turnover because of cross-linking and rapid endocytosis of the acetylcholine receptors. And there is a blockage of the active sites. Also, there is a atrophy and the loss of the troughs and furrows, which are seen in the edges of uh, the sarcolemma, because of which the sarcolemmal surface becomes flattened. Sometimes in patients who do not have an anti acetylcholine receptor antibody, they would have an anti musk antibody which interferes with the clustering of uh, acetylcholine receptors and 
therefore it results into prominent muscle atrophy so while in zero positive myasthenia you will not see muscle atrophy in zero negative myasthenia you will see prominent muscle atrophy of some of uh, the muscles there would be several patients who are double zero negative which means they are true zero negatives which do not have anti gestalcholine or anti musk antibodies these are unusual but not uncommon patients and uh, both uh, and uh, these antibodies which are seen against either anti musk or anti acetylcholine receptors are igg and are t cell dependent and hence the immunotherapeutic agents which we choose are either against the t cells which cause uh, uh, suppression of the t cell activity thereby taking care of the immunopathological mechanisms of myasthenia gravis Thymus is supposedly known to play an important role in myasthenia. About 70% of myasthenics would have a lymphoid follicular hyperplasia and about 10% would have a thymoma. There is a theory which says that there is probably an expression of the muscle fibers in the thymus in the juvenile states in patients with myasthenia because of which there is a, a, a sort of an antibody pool or an antibody clone which is there embedded in the thymus and over a period of time it tends to get uh, reactivated and myasthenia is generated so the disorders of the neuromuscular junction could be post synaptic like myasthenia gravis congenital myasthenia gravis neonatal and juvenile myasthenia they could be synaptic disorders like botulinum toxin or pre synaptic disorders like lambert eaton myasthenic syndrome so i will not be talking about uh, the other aspects i'll be predominantly talking about the post synaptic disorders which is myasthenia whether it would be ocular and generalized and musk positive myasthenic syndromes so this is a very classical photograph of a myasthenic patient which you'll find in most of the presentations but there is a definite way to classify myasthenia so there would be patients with ocular myasthenia mild generalized myasthenia moderate generalized acute severe and late severe so these are the four groups which were uh, told by Osserman and they are still holding true it is the most common disorder of the neuromuscular junction which was first described in 1672 by thomas willis and the name itself is basically explanatory as to what is happening in these patients gravis means severe and myasthenia means muscle weakness so it is a serious muscle weakness uh, which uh, myasthenia gravis connotates there is a loss of functional acetylcholine receptors because of an autoimmune response we have already talked about it and though there is no specific cure a significant treatment and uh, management is possible these patients present with fluctuating weakness which is increased by exertion the weakness increases during the day and improves with rest and uh, the extraocular muscle like ptosis is present initially as a manifesting features or a presenting feature in about 50% of patients and during the course of the disease about 90% of the patients will be affected by it sometimes there might be a weakness of the head extension and flexors the flexors are more commonly affected than the extensors there can be a progression of the disease to its variable extents uh, it might stay mild to moderate over several weeks to months usually it follows a pattern from ocular to facial to bulbar to truncal and limb muscles often the symptoms may remain only to the extraocular muscles and eyelids for years and in about 16% of patients it might remain ocular completely spontaneous remissions unfortunately are rare the most remissions uh, occur with treatment and are usually seen in the first 3 years they could have ocular facial bulba limb or a respiratory weakness so the ocular uh, weakness presents as a asymmetrical weakness of uh, several muscles of both the eyes and this weakness would be fluctuating so sometimes you will find that the medial rectus of one eye is affected and then the next day you will find that the rec lateral rectus of the other eye is affected the pupillary responses are normal 
the most commonly affected muscle is the medial uh, rectus muscle which is the most severely involved tosis is usually asymmetrical and varies during sustained activity to compensate for tosis there is a chronic contraction of the frontalis muscle but like this so they usually show a frowning or a surprised look Unilateral frontalis contraction is a clue that the lid elevators are weak on that particular side. The initial symptoms of ptosis and or diplopia are seen in up to 85% of patients and within two years of onset, almost 100% of patients sometime during the course of the disease would have a, a ocular or a, a ptosis symptom. And a myasthenic weakness that remains limited to the ocular muscles about in the first two years, about 90% of that disease will not generalize. It will remain confined to the ocular uh, segment only. Uh, I think we will leave this part. The confirmation of the diagnosis only in patients who have ocular symptoms is a little difficult because the electrophysiological study, the serological studies sometimes might be negative and single fiber EMG might often be required. So, so when the patient tries to contract the eyes very forcefully, then sometimes the eyes, they tend to not close properly and the palpebral fissure, it tends to separate slightly. And this is what we call as the peak sign because the fatigue muscle leads to a slight involuntary opening of the eyes as the patient tries to keep the eyes open, eyes closed. So this is the initial phase, but when he continues to do this pressure constantly, there is a mild opening of the eyes as if the patient is trying to peek uh, uh, during this uh, attempt. The weakness is variable, fluctuating and fatigable. Uh, it shifts from one side to other. So it is very, very difficult for an ocular disease or a cranial disease to cause a fluctuating and a variable tosis on each side. There sometimes might be pseudo internuclear ophthalmoplegia in, when, in which one eye has difficulty in adapting and the abducting eye has a, 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 a nystagmus. So this is basically a different type of manifestation which can be seen in myasthenia gravis. When it, the, the ocular weakness is mild, it might not be obvious on routine examination. And when you provocate, you ask the patient to constantly look up, then the eyelid tends to droop down. And this we call as a curtain sign. And when we apply some ice on it, and I'll be coming to it, there is going to be an improvement in the ptosis on that particular side. Facial weakness is almost always present. And there would be very few conditions in neurology where you will find the extraocular muscle weakness, a ptosis and a facial muscle weakness. And if you also have a coexistent neck muscle weakness, then there are very, very few conditions which will have all the three in the same patient. If it is fluctuating, then there is no other disease apart from myasthenia, which can cause this type of a symptomatology. When there is a bulbar weakness, then patients present with frequent choking, difficulty in swallowing, difficulty in coughing. As they continue to speak, the nose starts to coming from, starts to come from the nasal cavity, and there is a nasal twang. They might have a hoarseness while speaking, while drinking water. When they start sipping, it's okay, but when they continue to sip water, it tends to have a nasal regurgitation. Very few patients, uh, and these could be actually case reports, could present with isolated diaphragmatic palsy. We have at least three such cases. They could present with orthopnea. And so if you have an unexplained orthopnea in which the patient is severely dyspneic the moment he lies down and he becomes very significantly better when he sits, one should very strongly suspect uh, myasthenia in such patients. Now they have a characteristic facial expression at rest. They might be appearing distressed or depressed, but when they attempt to, attempt to smile, because their zygomaticus is weak, they show a snarling type of a face when they attempt to smile. The respiratory muscle weakness can present as an intercostal muscle and a diaphragmatic muscle weakness. 
because of which there is a retention of uh, CO2 due to recurrent hypoventilation and this might result into a neuromuscular emergency. Weakness of the pharyngeal muscle may collapse the upper airway. So one has to monitor these aspects for respiratory functions very, very carefully. And this should be done more frequently and more carefully in patients who have developed recent onset bulbar symptoms because as I'll be talking later, these are the early uh, signs which one should look for an impending crisis. Never rely on pulse oximetry and even the arterial blood oxygenation may be normal because it is the CO2 which is retained as this is a type 2 respiratory failure. One should always look for coexisting autoimmune diseases like hypothyroidism, which occurs in 10 to 15% of myasthenic patients. These patients might also have exophthalmos and tachycardia to the point. Um, and uh, the weakness may not improve with treatment of myasthenia gravis alone in patients with coexisting hyperthyroidism because there, there is a partial resistance to estalcholine esterase inhibitor drugs and also a partial resistance to the immunomodulation in hyperthyroidism. Patients might also have rheumatoid arthritis, scleroderma, lupus, and hypervitaminosis B12. They could have lump muscle weakness, uh, any type of weakness, any combination is possible, but it is the proximal muscles which are more commonly affected uh, than the upper limb muscles, uh, sorry, uh, than the distal muscles. And uh, the lower limb muscles are affected earlier than the upper limb muscles. So they would have difficulty in climbing stairs, getting up from a toilet seat, getting up from a chair much earlier than they present with difficulty in getting things from a high kept shelf. If the patient has proximal as well as distal muscle weakness, then one should think of a musk positive and a zero negative myasthenia clinically because musk positive patients you come sometimes might also have a distal weakness along with the proximal muscle weakness uh, i think this i've already told you what is important is that the neck flexors are very very commonly affected and these patients when lie down they would have difficulty in elevating their neck from a lying down posture and when you examine by putting your hand against the forehead and ask the patient to shift forward, then you can very easily uh, feel this weakness in the muscles of the neck. The extensors of the neck are usually not affected, but they can be affected. And if it is a musk positive, zero negative patient, then the chances of involvement of the extensors of the neck are high as compared to the flexors. Sometimes even in myasthenia gravis, which is seropositive, there might be a dropped head syndrome in which the patient would have difficulty in elevation the neck. They could have isolated vocal cord paralysis and isolated respiratory muscle weakness also. So, uh, it could be idiopathic myasthenia, it could be penicillin mean induced myasthenia, which is probably the commonest drug which is associated with uh, <coughs> drug induced myasthenia. And then we should also look for other drugs which can worsen a myasthenia and can sometimes precipitate a myasthenia. And these uh, is the uh, a rough list of drugs which can cause this. There are several differentials. Just a minute. There are several differential diagnoses, but if you look carefully, if a patient has fluctuating signs, fluctuating ptosis, fluctuating extraocular muscle weakness, facial muscle weakness, neck muscle weakness, and a fatigable proximal muscle weakness, there is virtually no differential diagnosis which falls into this category. But just for the purpose of naming, these things can be considered. So how do we uh, confirm the diagnosis? Well, if a patient has a eye problem or a ptosis or an extraocular muscle weakness, then I think the most simple test which one can do bedside and is fairly, fairly sensitive is application of an ice pack on the affected site. So what this does is that it cools down the neuromuscular junction. 
and therefore it increases the time during which the acetylcholine is available in the synaptic cleft and therefore it gives increased chance of interaction between the acetylcholine and the acetylcholine receptor and therefore these patients would show a transient improvement so this is the pre ice cold test and this is the post ice cold test so in two minutes you will be able to find a very significant difference in patients who are myasthenic so this is a test which is free of cost and if you look at its sensitivity and specificity in ocular myasthenia it almost matches that of a sophisticated repetitive nerve stimulation test then the uh, blood test so there are three types of tests uh, the uh, acetylcholine receptor binding bodies antibodies the acetylcholine receptor blocking antibodies and the anti mask antibodies so about 85% uh, of patients with generalized myasthenia and 50% of patients with ocular myasthenia would have a positive acetylcholine receptor binding antibodies. Blocking antibodies are extremely, extremely rare. So whenever you ask for a test, always be careful and ask for acetylcholine receptor binding antibodies because blocking antibodies, one, are more costlier, two, they take more time, three, they are less sensitive. Anti-mask antibodies are seen in about 50% of generalized myasthenic patients who are seronegative for acetylcholine receptor antibodies. And some patients with ocular myasthenia might have a mask positivity. Then there would be true seronegative patients where there would be no antibody detected and they would be comprising about 10 to 12% of the total population of myasthenia. And then this very, very rare subgroup of double zero positive. And to the best of my knowledge, there are only three case reports in the world where patients are positive even for musk and for acetylcholine receptor binding antibodies. And one of this case was contributed by our group when I was in AIMS. So these patients who have double zero positive, it will be once in a lifetime type of case, which you will see. And uh, they would have a very, very severe disease. Uh, the diagnostic procedures of electrophysiology and uh, the challenge tests. Adrophonium test is good for the ocular muscles, but unfortunately, adrophonium is not available in India. Neostigmine uh, should ideally be done in a setting where a critical care specialist is available. And this should always be done after the pre-medication with IV atropine. Uh, we give neostigmine in the doses of 0 0.022 milligram per kilogram body weight. And if there is a cholinergic response, we can counter it by giving atropine. If there is an improvement, there is a likely possibility it is myasthenia gravis. Now, when you're performing this test, you don't do a vague endpoint evaluation. So you have to have a specific, clearly visible endpoint. For example, if a patient has a definite medial rectus weakness and after you give neostigmine, the medial rectus imp uh, muscle improves completely. If a patient cannot get up from a sitting position or a squatting position and after giving neostigmine, he is able to get it, then it is a very, very clear indication that this is a positive thing. If a patient feels better, if a patient says, yes, my ptosis appears to be better, it is not a ideally positive test. So you should have a clear measurable endpoint for the neostigmine test. The electrophysiological evaluation. Uh, so you can see that in the best positive cases of uh, repetitive nerve stimulation test in a patient with ocular myasthenia, the sensitivity and specificity is only 50%. Whereas ice pack test has a sensitivity and specificity of about 95%. And this is a very expensive test. <coughs> and how much is going to be the cost of two ice cubes? One can easily understand. So uh, Estel, uh, single fiber uh, EMG is a very sensitive and a very specific test for, uh, for the, uh, problems in the neuromuscular junction. But not to the myasthenia gravis specifically. Now, what we do is we are basically doing in electrophysiology a reproduction of our clinical examination. 
in the clinical examination we ask the patient to perform a repetitive arm abduction and as we performs repetitive arm abduction there is a fatigue which is elicitable similarly in patients with uh, electrophysiological evaluation by doing a repetitive nerve stimulation test we are doing a tetanic stimulation of these muscles rapidly in a set of four so we are basically doing nothing we are just uh, reproducing the clinical examination so repetitive nerve stimulation test is a test to look for fatigability in the involved muscles i am not going to go deeply into the details but what is important is that the electrophysiologist who is doing it should be asking the patient to stop the acetylcholinesterase inhibitor drugs about 12 hours before the test he should not consume any drug before the test there is a specific way of doing that test and the stimulation rate has to be 0.1 hertz then there is a post stimulation potentiation which one has to be checked and then there is a post stimulation fatigue which has to be tested so all these three segments have to be evaluated and then a conclusion has to be drawn now what is a single fiber emg a single fiber emg is the evaluation of the electromyographic activity of a single muscle fiber so what happens is that when the impulse is transmitted from the cortex and it goes into the neuromuscular junction then there is going to be a delay of transmission of the impulse across the neuromuscular junction which is going to be variable across the different segments of neuromuscular junction so sometimes the impulse is going to reach the muscle fiber at n plus 0.01 milliseconds and sometimes it is going to enter into another muscle fiber at n plus 0.05 milliseconds so there is going to be a variable difference of 0.01 to 0.05 milliseconds between different different muscle fibers whereas if a person is having a normal neuromuscular junction all the impulses are going to arrive and reach the muscle almost simultaneously so this variability is called as jitter so it is basically the difference of the arrival of impulses at the neuromuscular junction across different muscle fibers so in single mu uh, muscle fiber emg this jitter is increased in size and that is what we look for single fiber emg is an extremely extremely sensitive test it can be done only at specific centers in india there are hardly two or three which can do it properly the interpretation of the results is difficult basically nothing is going to be very helpful if you get a single fiber emg done that is the conclusion which we draw out of the importance of single fiber emg rnst i have already told you reporting technique stimulation technique is predominantly for the electrophysiologists to look at now we'll come to the treatment of myasthenia gravis so uh, there would be four segments of treatment one is acetylcholine esterase inhibitors which inhibit the enzyme acetylcholine esterase and when this enzyme is inhibited the chance and the duration for which the acetylcholine stays in the neuromuscular junction is higher and it gets more chance to interact with the acetylcholine receptors then there would be immunomodulating therapies which basically control the primary disease process of autoimmunity then there would be emergency or acute treatments like plasmapheresis and iv immunoglobulins and finally there would be thymectomy so uh, in the present communication i'll be touching predominantly on the first three segments and will be speaking extremely briefly on thymectomy so there are two types of three types of uh, acetylcholine esterase inhibitors which are available one is diostigmine then there is pyridostigmine and then there is extended release pyridostigmine so pyridostigmine uh, starts working in about 30 to 60 minutes and its effect lasts for about 3 to 6 hours one has to individualize the dose 
It's 60 to 960 milligrams per day given orally. Uh, it is not available in India as an injectable dose. And uh, it is uh, better to be given when the patient has generalized myasthenic symptoms and it might not be completely effective for ocular symptoms. Now, why is it so? The body has two types of muscle fibers. One are the slow twitch muscle fibers in which the number of neuromuscular junctions per square centimeter of muscle is low. So these are the larger muscles, which are the prime movers of the extremities. For example, the deltoids, the quadriceps, the iliopsoas. So they are slow twitch fibers. They are basically anti-gravity muscles and power generating muscles. So there, the number of neuromuscular junctions is low. The acetylcholine receptor density is low. And therefore, a longer acting drug acts better in these symptoms. If a patient has predominantly ocular symptoms, then pyridostigmine might not be the best option because in the eye muscles, the neuromuscular junctions are very high in terms of the numbers, in terms of the density per square centimeter, in terms of the clustering, per uh, cluster. So therefore, there we need a drug which starts acting faster, like neostigmine. So if a patient has both the symptoms, it might be worthwhile combining pyridostigmine for the generalized symptoms. And if the patient has troublesome ocular symptoms or troublesome ptosis, then neostigmine might be added to that regimen. Immunosuppressing therapies, um, steroids, the all-time favorites, it's the most commonly used corticosteroid. It causes significant improvement. The improvement starts very early, as early as uh, two to three weeks. The only point is that it is associated with significant amount of side effects in practically everybody. So everybody is going to have weight gain. Everybody is going to have uh, an increase in blood pressure. Everybody is going to have uh, in, uh, increased chances of fungal infection, increased chances of coexistent infections. So it is not necessary that steroids have to be given for the entire duration of treatment. They have to be replaced by other drugs, which we call as steroid sparing drugs, which I'll come to you later. Now, what are the principles of giving steroids? Steroids should never ever be started in high dosage. Now, why is it so? There are several reasons to it. When we give high doses of steroids right from the beginning, then steroids have several impacts on the neuromuscular junction. The first is that they have a potential membrane stabilizing activity. So they decrease the end plate potential. Therefore, the action potential would be achieved at a much higher stimulus as compared to the usual thing. Second is that they decrease the release of acetylcholine from the presynaptic nerve terminal. Third is they decrease the affinity of the acetylcholine with the acetylcholine receptors. So these three pronged uh, reasons cause a increased worsening of the myasthenic symptoms and sometimes it can be a reason for triggering of a myasthenic crisis so always start steroids in low doses and increase it over a period of time maintain it for a period of time and then bring it down gradually over a period of time so slow start Maintenance and slow withdrawal is the dictum for steroids. Otherwise, you will definitely indice a myasthenic crisis in these patients. So though it is the most commonly prescribed drug, and sorry for the spelling, only two trials of total 37 patients, and this trial was done in 1976, is the evidence which supports the use of prednisolone in myasthenia gravis. Other drugs which can be used are uh, as a thioprene, two to three milligrams per kg, methotrexate, mycophenolate. So these are the three drugs, as a thioprene, methotrexate, and mycophenolate, which are the ones which we use as a routine. But other drugs like cyclosporine, tacrolimus, cyclophosphamide, rituximab, these are the ones which are 
used as a, a, a sort of a reserve drug for myasthenia. So this is a randomized trial. Now you should understand that there are very few randomized trials which have been done on methotrexate and azathioprine in myasthenia gravis. There are more trials using mycophenolate for myasthenia gravis and most of them are negative trials. Despite that, mycophenolate is being promoted as a very important drug for myasthenia, which I don't agree to. So therefore, let us see what is available as evidence, if we call it as evidence. So this was the randomized trial of azathioprine or prednisolone for initial immunosuppressive treatment of myasthenia. So these were only 10 patients who were randomized to azathioprine or steroids. Five patients to azathioprine, four patients to were switched over to prednisolone. All the patients which are initially randomized to prednisolone improved, but the degree varied amongst patients. The side effect of the azathioprine were idiosyncratic reactions and the side effects of steroids were manageable. This was the trial comparing prednisolone with azathioprine alone and with the uh, 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 prednisolone and azathioprine as a group. Again, uh, Azathioprine <coughs> was eventually found useful as a steroid sparing drug and that is what it is being used still. So these are the two recent trials and thankfully both of them are from India. They are retrospective trials. One was by Dubey et al. from uh, the south and uh, by Gupta et al. From, uh, the a from Ames. So they have highlighted the steroid sparing effect of azathioprine. What is important is that azathioprine takes two to three months for its effect to come in. So what we do is we start steroids, say 10 milligrams per kilogram, uh, 10 milligrams per day, increase it over four to five weeks to one milligram per kilogram body weight per day. We also steroid start azathioprine or other immunosuppressant like methotrexate or mycophenolate. And then we increase it every two weeks by doing repeated liver function tests, kidney function tests and a complete blood count to see for any potential side effects of these drugs till we reach the maximum possible dose or the maximum tolerable dose of other immunosuppressants. Then we maintain both azathioprine and steroids for about four to six weeks. Then we gradually bring down the steroids and let the patient be maintained on the alternative immunosuppressants as it is. Now, why is it so? Is because azathioprine takes about two to three months for its effect to set in. Methotrexate takes about two to three months for its effect to set in. Mycophenolate takes about three to six months for its effect to set in. Therefore, one has to be very patient in achieving the remission in patients with myasthenia. And this has to be told to these patients. The side effect profile of all these three drugs, that is azathioprine, methotrexate, and mycophenolate, should be discussed with the patients. Uh, azathioprine, I have the, uh, I, I, my, 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 my favorite drug is azathioprine, but it is associated with significant comorbidities in the form of thrombocytopenia and altered uh, uh, liver function tests, frank hepatotoxicity. So I always get a TPMT gene mutation done to preempt the possible side effects and then decide whether this patient is good for azathioprine or not. Mycophenolate, I've already told you, there are four trials to evaluate the role of MMF in myasthenia gravis. The two initial ones, which were given up to 36 weeks, were negative. But this was not the right way because we already know that it starts working in about three to four months. So the later ones, which continued for more than six months, showed improvement and more than half of the patients were we able to taper off the steroids. The side effects are nausea, gastric upsets, and rarely uh, leukopenia. So mycophenolate uh, should not be given up uh, as an option before you have tried it for at least six to eight months for its efficacy. Of course, you can combine mycophenolate and azathioprine. You can combine mycophenolate with methotrexate uh, if one of them is not working well. 
Rituximab, uh, there are several small case series. And it is a reserved drug for refractory myasthenia. Uh, the first study, which was a BEAT, my MG study, uh, it was a double blended uh, trial, did not show any promising results. And it, this was despite a uh, adequate B cell depletion, which was achieved. Currently, we use it as a reserved drug for musk positive myasthenia and severe generalized seropositive myasthenia, which is not responding to other immunosuppressants. And this was a retrospective study from AIMS. It was where it was found to be effective in severe cases, but multiple doses might be needed to achieve a steroid free remission. Before we uh, start a patient on rituximab, always remember to uh, to prime the patient with steroids, Abel and paracetamol, and get an X-ray chest done, get a Mudduk done to rule reasonably out that the patient is not suffering from active tuberculosis. There are other drugs which are in the pipeline: aculizumab, rosanolexizumab, ifragotimod. These are all uh, in several phases of trials, but these are all reserved drugs to be used only in unusual and rare cases where nothing else is working or two or three immunosuppressions have already failed. Then we come to uh, the treatment of and the identification of myasthenic crisis. Now myasthenic crisis is a life-threatening condition. There is no doubt about it and that's why it's called as crisis. It's defined as a weakness from acquired myasthenia gravis that is severe enough to necessitate intubation or delay extubation Following a surgery or a stressful event, the patient during this time required to be on ventilatory support. There is a respiratory failure because of either respiratory muscle weakness and or orophyngeal muscle weakness leading to an upper airway obstruction. About 10 to 20 percent of patients of myasthenia gravis can have at least one episode of crisis in their lifetime. About 13 to 20 percent of the patients, the crisis can be the first manifestation of the disease, and the annual risk of myasthenic crisis in patients is approximately two to three percent. Respiratory failure can be because of respiratory muscle weakness and or oropharyngeal muscle weakness leading to upper airway obstruction, as I've already told you, or a combination of both. So this is a rough uh, sort of a pathophysiological uh, algorithm as to why myasthenic crisis is caused. So there could be two arms to this. One could be a ventilatory muscle weakness, which is the simpler component, which causes a decrease in the tidal volume. There is a functional residual capacity, which is compromised. This causes uh, hyperventilation and uh, uh, increase in dead space with altered VQ uh, ratios. Along with that, because of decreased tidal volume, there would be atelectasis, microaspirations, increased upper airway uh, resistance, which might be complicated by associated pneumonia. So this hypoventilation uh, causes hypoxemia and hypercapnia, hypercapnia predominantly causing respiratory failure. On the other hand, if there is only bulbar weakness, then there can be accumulation of secretions in the oropharyngeal lake. There is an alteration uh, sign mechanism, cough and swallowing reflexes, which again leads to atelectasis, microaspirations, and causes pneumonia. This pneumonia in itself would worsen the myasthenic condition and trigger off a crisis. So both these mechanisms probably interplay while causing these uh, uh, triggering of a myasthenic crisis. There is increased generalized or bulbar weakness as a warning. Sorry. The respiratory insufficiency can be out of proportion to the limb or bulbar weakness. And in a report of 44 patients who uh, developed 63 episodes of myasthenic crisis, the crisis began with generalized weakness, bulbar symptoms, or weakness of respiratory muscles in 76, 19, and 5 percent patients, respectively. The generalized weakness can mask the signs of respiratory distress. The weak respiratory muscles may fatigue suddenly and can lead to respiratory collapse. And many times uh, you should not rely on a nice looking, comfortable patient that he will not develop crisis soon. 
so you should always look for warning signals or signs of impending crisis before you actually find the crisis and you can actually take preemptive decisions the bulbar weakness may cause aspiration and upper uh, respiratory obstruction uh, told you concurrent infections pregnancy surgical intervention high doses of steroids or sudden withdrawal of steroids tapering of immunosuppressive drugs and several types of drugs can trigger off myasthenia so these are the various types of antibiotics the quinolones the magnesium containing preparations beta blockers calcium channel blockers several types of cardiac drugs like fenamide anticonvulsants like phenytoin nitrosoxamide gabapentin uh, and psychiatric medicines can worsen uh, thenic syndrome and trigger an acute crisis of which the most important ones are the antibiotics which would be the culprits most commonly so increased generalized or bulbar weakness a reducing single breath count or a breath holding time observation that the accessory muscles of respiration are being used and appearance of bulbar features which were not there previously are the potential warning signals and these patients should be warned and counseled strongly to get admitted because these are the ones who are more likely to develop a crisis eventually over a period of time these patients who are in the process of developing a crisis or have developed a myasthenic crisis cannot be managed in a room or in the opd they have to be admitted to a icu we have to assess the respiratory function it is preferable to get a elective intubation done rapid therapy has to be instigated and the immunomodulation has to be started asap we have to wean them off carefully and we have to take care of the complications as and when they arise <coughs> so as i have already told you a rapidly increasing weakness secondary to an exacerbation of myasthenia gravis merits uh, admission in icu they should be frequently monitored for symptoms of uh, dyspnea severe dysphagia weak cough and difficulty in clearing secretions and uh, signs of respiratory weakness so the evaluation of uh, the tidal volume is probably the single most uh, effective and the easiest way to understand the going down respiratory reserve and the requirement for ventilatory support so uh, the vital capacity reflects and this is not the i think for on which i need to tell the critical care specialists about the importance of vital capacity but uh, there there are other people also who need to be you know told about this so the vital capacity reflects the mechanical function of both inspiratory and expiratory strength and can be performed easily in the bedside some experts recommend that assessing <coughs> both the supine and sitting vital capacity uh, is important as the diaphragmatic weakness is more apparent on the supine measurement and because of the 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 pressure of the abdominal contents the diaphragm is pushed up when a patient is in a supine position therefore the vital capacity is further compromised so it is worthwhile evaluating it both in a sitting and a lying down position the mip is another evolving criteria for evaluation of the inspiratory muscle strength uh, the patient is instructed to maximally inhale against a closed valve and the force or the pressure which is generated at the mouth is recorded so the inspiration is a negatively generated force and thus the values are recorded as a negative number so a uh, mip below 1/3 of normal for example 0 to 30 minus centimeter of uh, water predicts a severe respiratory muscle weakness and a probable impending hypercarbic respiratory failure while a mip of minus 60 is usually associated only with a weak cough so this is a evolving concept in terms of the requirement or indications of uh, intubation in myasthenic patients so uh, this is normal the first vital capacity more than 60 uh, mip or a nip more than 70 and a peak uh, <coughs> positive expiratory pressure of more than 100 a patient who has a fvc of less than 20 uh, nip of less than minus 30 above 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 minus 30 i'm sorry this is in negative above minus 
and a PEP of less than 40. These are the criteria for uh, intubation. Uh, winning should be attempted when the FVC is more than 15, the NIP is more than 20, and the PEP is more than 40. And these are the criteria for extubation. Of course, the critical care specialists know it better, but it is worthwhile tending for the uninitiated. Uh, monitoring of the SpO2 and the ABG might be in sensitive measures of respiratory muscle weakness because they often develop only after the onset of life-threatening respiratory failure. The development of progressive hypercarbic respiratory acidosis despite therapy might provide supportive evidence that prompts earlier rather than late intubation. So uh, elective intubation, I have already told you when it is to be done. Uh, the persistent depolarizing drugs as muscle relaxants are preferable. The curare myometic drugs are best avoided because they would be acting uh, 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 strongly in these patients. It is always advisable to have a rapid sequence intubation there is practically zero role for NIV uh, in uh, patients with myasthenic crisis. It is almost always that a full fledged ventilatory support is required because NIV is not going to achieve what a full fledged ventilatory support is going to give you. Always start the chest physio suction bronchodilators as soon as possible. As soon as the patient is going on a ventilator, <coughs> the Cholinesterase inhibitors should be stopped. And this is because, sorry. And this is because uh, what can go worse for a myasthenic patient than going on a ventilator? So he is already in the worst possible situation. And when the patient is on a ventilator, his most important requirement for his body is already achieved. So he is maintaining his oxygenation. And he's washing out carbon dioxide. So what will a drug holiday help is that it will make the acetylcholine receptors more hungry for uh, the acetylcholine. There would be a possible mechanism which we will induce by giving uh, IV immunoglobulin or a plasma exchange to remove the acetylcholine uh, uh, receptor binding antibodies from the acetylcholine receptor sites. And the patient, when we start the acetylcholine uh, uh, esterase inhibitors later, once the uh, the once the, the the immunomodulating therapy has taken its place, the response to these drugs would be better. Then, if we continue to give cholinesterase inhibitors, there is going to be a worsening of secretions because of this cholinomyomatic effect, and the when the the increased secretions are going to have a problem in the anesthetic management of uh, the ventilatory support and a suction would be required more frequently if a patient is being given these drugs. So a drug holiday, what I do is that I continue to give the patient a drug holiday till either 70% of IV immunoglobulin or the fourth cycle of plasma exchange has not finished. And only then I reintroduce acetylcholine uh, esterase inhibitors. And that is when you have several benefits. One is that your weaning is better. At that time, the patient's uh, suctioning would be required less till that time. So therefore, these two things are a added benefit for an anesthetist or a critical care specialist to be more comfortable with the ventilatory support. I've already told you this. I don't think I need to repeat it. Uh, I don't know. I think there is a repeat of these slides. So if there are too many secretions, then glycopyrrolate may be, uh, may be uh, uh, initiated. Don't start steroids if the patient has not been on steroids. However, if the patient has already been on steroids, there is no need to stop them. Azathioprine has neither benefit nor a problem if you start during a patient with, with, with the myasthenic crisis because it is not going to have its impact. Similarly, other immunomodulators will have zero impact. So steroids are and it's a question which several people ask. Steroids, if 
have been continuing in a dose of say 1 mg per kg body weight, do nothing, continue them on the same dose. If the patient has never been initiated on steroids and has presented with myasthenic crisis, then at the time when you are starting to wean, at that time add low doses of steroids, never a full dose. And if the patient is weanable easily, then there is no harm in starting the steroids even on the OPD basis. It is not necessary that we start steroids uh, immediately in the peri-extubation period. So no hurry to start steroids would be the best statement. Manage the infections uh, as best as you can and try to wean as soon as possible. But at the same time, never be in a hurry to extubate because a reintubation is going to be more problematic than a delayed extubation or a tracheostomy over a period of time. Uh, so which is the drug which is to be given as a immunomodulatory therapy for a myasthenic crisis. So there are two options which we can try. One is an intravenous immunoglobulin. The dose is two gram per kilogram infused over two to five days. And the second is plasma exchange. So both of these options are very good options. If we look at the evidence, then both of them weighted equally or almost equally with IVIG being more comfortable to give but more expensive to give plasma exchange with slight more side effects less comfortable to do a little more cumbersome process but in terms of their efficacy in controlling the myasthenic crisis probably both of them are almost balanced now to whom we offer which segment of treatment would depend upon where the treatment is being offered now, when you are giving uh, IVIG in a government sector, then you give IVIG, which the patient can buy from a pharmacy outside, and it is available to him at about 50% of the MRP. So the total cost of a five day treatment for a 50 kilogram person would be somewhere around uh, 2 lakh rupees. Whereas if you are getting it in a private hospital, the billing is almost always on the MRP. So the cost of the same uh, IVIG for a period of five days would be about four to 4.25 lakh rupees. Then every day there would be a admission charge, which would be about 6,000 to 10,000 rupees, depending upon the type of bed which the patient is choosing. So the total cost of IVIG would come to somewhere around 5 lakh rupees for a 50 kg individual. In a government sector, the same cost is going to come about 2 lakh rupees for an individual. Now let us look at the plasma exchange. Plasma exchange in a government sector will cost practically nothing. It, will going, it is going to cost about 10,000 rupees only for the kit, which the patient might have to buy, might not have to buy in several government institutions. There is no charge for the machine. There is no charge for the bed. There is no charge for the perfusionist. There is no procedure charge. There is no nursing charge. And because the plasma exchange is usually done on alternate days, there is no hurry for the patient to be discharged because he's not paying for the beds. However, this procedure is costing the government or the taxpayer almost an equal amount of money. So if one has to decide which treatment is to be given, it is more dependent on economics rather than efficacy or the side effect profiling. So in a Government sector, I think plasma exchange might be a very cheap option as compared to IVIG. Whereas in a private institution, IVIG and plasma exchange would probably be the same cost with plasma exchange slightly cheaper as compared to IVIG. 
So plasma exchange, we have to look at the side effects. It can cause uh, arrhythmias, it can cause perfusion related uh, abnormalities. Uh, it can cause transfusion related abnormalities because plasma is given to them or albumin is given to them. It can cause uh, hypertension, cardiac abnormalities in older individuals. IVIG on the contrary does not have much side effects. It is to with the uh, nephropathy and in patients who have a IgA nephropathy associated or IgA deficiency because it can cause anaphylaxis. Uh, it can cause hyponatremia and of late we have seen a lot of patients developing hyponatremia next uh, secondary to IVIG administration. So this is basically a nutshell about what type of treatment is to be given. So I always counsel my patients that these are the two options which are available. This is the side effect of this drug. This is the side effect of this procedure. This is how much this is going to cost. This is how much this is going to cost. Efficacy is going to be almost equal. And I'm not surprised that uh, most of these people would eventually choose IV immunoglobulin because of the ease of efficacy and the avoidance of a cumbersome procedure like putting in a catheter, taking the blood out, cleaning it, pushing it back. So that is what the people usually prefer, but the efficacy of both these things is almost identical. And if you look at the trials, the number of patients is abysmally low, but still there are no new trials which have evaluated plasma exchange or IVIG head-to-head -head comparison in large trials. So maximum patients have been evaluated in uh, both of these cases are up to 100 to 110. And this was my article which was published. It was a randomized double-blinded trial uh, to evaluate the comparative efficacy of low dose daily versus alternate day plasma exchange and severe myasthenia. So we found that whether you do the myasthenic, uh, whether you do the plasma exchange daily, or you do it on alternate days, the efficacy is almost equal. But in a private sector, the cost of the stay and the total cost incurred to the patient would be low because usually we give plasma exchange on alternate day. If we give it on a daily basis, then five day admission cost to the patient in a private sector is going to be low. So I've already told which one of the two is to be chosen. Now, once we have given the patient uh, the uh, specific treatment for the crisis and uh, the immunomodulation, then we observe how the patient is responding and uh, we attempt a weaning. The principles for weaning are same as for the general population, but one has to pay particular attention to measure the indices of respiratory muscle strength and the secretion clearance. We preferably start weaning only after a significant component of either plasma exchange or IVIG is over. And there is an improving uh, evidence of respiratory muscle strength with the parameters of vital capacity and the MIP, which I had already mentioned. Uh, select cases might require tracheostomy. And I've already told you that one should restart estalcholine esterase inhibitors once induction therapy has reached to its about 70 to 80%. Now, it is very, very important to say that though one should be energetic in weaning, one should never ever be energetic in extubation. One should be very carefully observing the patient Never be in a hurry, never hesitate to tracheostomize. Counsel the patient's attendants that it is important that the patient's respiratory apparatus, the respiratory tract and the, <coughs> the lungs are protected. So a delayed extubation is not a problem. Tracheostomy with delayed cannulation is not a problem, but a reintubation or a recannulation is going to be much more of a problem. So this is an individualized decision. There are no fixed guidelines, no fixed criteria, which can tell that this is the time when definitely extubation should be done. This is the time when definite tracheostomy should be done. This is when a decannulation has to be done.
the complications are pneumonia, bronchitis, urinary tract infections. Uh, there is increased risk for vascular complications like DVT, heart failure, acute MI, cardiac arrhythmias. And there are several uh, case reports of uh, stress-induced cardiomyopathy, which we call as uh, Takotsubo cardiomyopathy associated with myasthenic crisis. So these one has to be careful about. And uh, 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 I think no better forum to understand this than the critical care specialists. Now, thymectomy, I will be very, very briefly touching on it because it is a curative component of it. Till now, it was considered as a controversial component in the myasthenia gravis treatment. But over a period of time, and more so in the last, uh, I think, five or six years, there is sufficient data to say that it should be offered as a treatment option with modest benefits in patients with generalized myasthenia. So, This was a systematic review of 21 studies. These were controlled but non-randomized crude corrected remission rates were analyzed. So you can see that all these trials were positive, who showed a positive association between thymectomy and myasthenia gravis. And at that time, the American Academy had recommended that thymectomy should be an option rather than a standard procedure. But then this was a, a landmark trial which was published in 2016. And this was a trial which was initiated by Professor John Newsom Davis, uh, who is supposed to be the father of modern myasthenia. But unfortunately, he died in a crash. And I was supposed to be a, a, a contributor from India. But unfortunately, I was not able to participate because of his untimely demise. So uh, it was found in... Uh, uh, this trial that there was a very significant uh, improvement in those patients who were offered thymectomy. So let us conclude about the thymectomy. So thymectomy should be given in patients who have thymoma irrespective of the type of myasthenia. All myasthenia patients with thymoma, it might be of benefit in seropositive myasthenics who are less than 65 years of age and in the early phases of the disease which means that within the first two years of the onset of generalized myasthenia so uh, we have been associated with thymectomy right from 2000 when we started the first vats in aims from 2000 to 2008 me and dr vinay goyal and dr arvind together performed uh, within us, about 200 uh, videoscopic assisted thymectomies for myasthenia gravis with or without thymoma. In 2008, um, uh, we started the robotic thymectomy for the first time and about 80 thymectomies were done till 2012 by uh, Dr. Arvind. And then I have always, always been touch, in touch with him until 2018, uh, 124 robotic thymectomies were done in Sargangaram hospital. What is important is that you should remove as much thymus gland as possible. So everything in the pre in the mediastinum, anterior mediastinum, right from the thymic, uh, the thyroid notch above to the subdiaphragmatic ligaments and everything between the left and the right phrenic nerve should be avoid, should be removed. So the more you remove, the better are the results. So this is how the video, the robotic thymectomy is undertaken and this is how the surgery is performed. I'm not going to go into detail. So then uh, just one slide about musk antibody positive myasthenia gravis. Uh, about 50% uh, of those patients who are seronegative would have a musk positive myasthenia. It is highest in people who live close to the equator more common in female and more common in the african asian community the cranial and the bulbar muscles are very significantly affected there is a very significant weakness of the neck extensors unlike the neck flexors which are affected in musk positive sorry uh, acetylcholine receptor uh, antibody positive myasthenia uh, RNST is usually negative. Single fiber EMG might be a more uh, better option. 
usually these patients uh, have a poor response to acetylcholine esterase inhibitor. They have a dramatic response to plasma exchange and corticosteroids. Mm -hmm. IVIG might not be a good option. And uh, this is the classical presentation in an African black where you will find a significant tongue atrophy, a significant atrophy of the facial musculature and a neck extensor weakness. Uh, uh, rituximab is coming up as a big, uh, uh, you know, rescuer for these patients who otherwise have a very poor response to treatment. And this is an evaluation of multicenter uh, trials where 119 patients over 10 years were uh, randomized uh, and evaluated for their responsiveness. And they were found that uh, rituximab might be better than other immunosuppressants for musk positive myasthenia. So in general, uh, myasthenia gravis is a disease which has to be taken care of with an extreme caution. One has to have a team which comprises a neurologist, a electrophysiologist, and more importantly, a critical care specialist, because we really don't know which patient is going to land into myasthenic crisis at what time. A timely intervention of an impending crisis, a intubation at the right time, a management of uh, the immunomodulation at the right time, a weaning at the right time, a decannulation at the right time is extremely, extremely important for patients with myasthenia. And it is also important to understand that we have to identify patients and counsel them about thymectomy, a definitive option in terms of its treatment. And also tell them very, very clearly that the treatment has to be followed by the book. They cannot change their treatment options while they continue to be careful about avoiding those medications which can cause a trigger for myasthenia and myasthenia crisis. Thank you very much for your kind attention and I bring you regards from the entire team of neurosciences at uh, Artemis Hospitals in Gurgaon. Thank you very much, sir. I think this is the most comprehensive review of myasthenia I have heard <laughs> in, in recent times. Uh, Thank you. And many, many thanks to you. You speak for almost one and a half hours. And I think if I we are not going to stop you, you can speak for another another <laughs> two hours on myasthenia. Th thanks <laughs> thanks for this uh, uh, extensive lecture, sir. There are some questions uh, which are right now in the chat box. I will quickly take those questions so that no questions should be uh, left unanswered. So the mm -hmm. first will be, uh, sir, what is the survival rate of patients with severe myasthenic crisis who get intubated in your hospital? I don't remember a death. Yeah. I no. don't remember a death. N never. I don't remember a death. So uh, we uh, are proud to say actually that we treat myasthenia with a conviction and uh, a passion. So we would be... Uh, losing our sleep on myasthenia and myasthenic crisis and go to all possible extent between me and Saurabh to uh, hold the patient and uh, fight with the God not to take him. Yes. So, and the second question will be the regarding Plex and IVIG. Is there any evidence or rational in repeating the course in treatment of refractory cases, say two to three weeks of ICU admission? How yes, is very, very good question. I did not touch base on that. So, <clears throat> Uh, it is important that plasma exchange cannot be done after IVIG straight away. But IVIG can be given after plasma exchange straight away. There is no fixed number of plasma exchanges, but there is a fixed number of IVIG which can be given. So I have given plasma exchange of up to 14 exchanges in a single person. When I was in uh, Vedanta and Saurabh, you were also there. I remember the patient. She was uh, um, a lady from uh, Patna who eventually, unfortunately, uh, died at that time because of, uh, I think, uh, I think a DVT and a pulmonary embolism. 
Yes, anyway. So we have had 14 plasma exchanges done for the same patient. So what is advisable is that plasma exchange, you can continue till the patient starts to show improvement. But IVIG, you have to give up to five things, then wait for a week, then give another uh, second course. So if the patient's attendance are okay, I think plasma exchange should also be offered as a first option in more severe cases. Because then you have a second option of IVIG to fall back upon. Sir, if I will say so that uh, plasma exchange will give you more rapid response or but IVIG will give you a more sustained response. Is it the right You're thing absolutely to Absolutely right. Absolutely right. That's what I'm saying. So if the, the patient attended, I told you that efficacy wise, both are equal. But if I gave a choice to both and it's my duty and my ethics ask me to tell that both are equally efficacious because that is what the patients should be told. But still, they will go in for IVIG. Are injection hi to lagana hai. What is the problem? Plasma exchange mare, pehle catheter jayega, phir blood nikalenge, itna bada machine aayega, blood niklega, phir wapis jayega, phir uske baad plasma lagega. So it is always convenience which patients choose. Okay. Then there is one more question. Can only aspiration be a sign of myasthenia? Uh, if you allow me, I will just uh, add a you few. You have more. had experience of two patients. Yeah, yeah, two patients. So I will say that, see, if as sir has rightly put it in the lecture, hypoxemia is not uh, never been seen in myasthenic. But if you see hypoxemia, which is actually a sign of going atelectasis and might be a sign of aspiration pneumonia. So if aspiration is going on in a patient of myasthenia, it is that you need to look at the chest x-ray. That might be bulbar policy might already be there and patient might be aspirating. So we have received two patients who severely in a myasthenic crisis and were actually aspirating. Their chest x-ray were bad, treated on lines of sepsis initially. And then we came to know that these patients have myasthenics. So uh, uh, aspiration can be a presenting symptom. I, I'm not going to deny that. So, do patients of bulbar myasthenic require IVIG plasma pheresis in view of impending crisis or we should wait for pyridostigmine and steroids to act? Sorry? And do patients of bulbar myasthenics require IVIG or plasma pheresis in view of impending crisis or we should wait for pyridostigmine and steroids to act? No, no. You should give IVIG as soon as possible. Because preventing myasthenic crisis is much, much better than managing myasthenic crisis. So the moment you find that a patient who had generalized myasthenia and then he develops, uh, you know, bulbar features, don't wait. Start IVIG or plasma exchange straight away and uh, don't wait for the uh, drugs to take their impact. Because I'll tell you, I was in AIMS. And we started our round on bed number one. There were six beds in a cubicle. The bed number one patient was that of myasthenia gravis. And he said that I have some problems in my swallowing since morning. We took round of that cubicle till bed number six. Went to the next cubicle. By that time, which would hardly be 20 minutes. Bed number one patient started having features of crisis and he had to be intubated in the ward. So a myasthenic patient with impending crisis should be treated like an emergency and like crisis only. Okay. Then there is one more question. What should be done in patients who are on maximal medical therapy, thymectomy done, IVIG given and patient is still symptomatic? There could be some patients like this because thymus is not only in the thymic region. There is ectopic thymic tissue, which is present in the subglottic region. It is present in the suprathyroid region. It is present in the perimediastinal space, not in the mediastinal, but in the perimediastinal space. So this ectopic thymic tissue might still be producing acetylcholine receptor antibodies and causing features of myasthenia. So we should always 
do a acetylcholine receptor antibody test in these patients. And if we find high titers, then they should be subjected to either a technetium 99M spec or a PET scan to look for ectopic thymic tissue and try to remove it if possible. And these patients are ideal candidates for rituximab. Because where nothing else works, rituximab can be tried. You can also try cyclophosphamide pulse in such patients. Rituximab, there is one more question. Can rituximab be used in myasthenic crisis? Not exactly, not exactly. Because rituximab takes about two months for its efficacy to turn it completely. So not the best drug for myasthenic crisis where we need almost immediate response. So, how many days the myasthenia is to be treated even with no symptoms for years? Sorry? How many days myasthenic needs to be treated if they don't have any symptoms? I think what he's wanting to say is that the patient has yeah. achieved a remission. And yeah. how long do we treat such patients? Okay. So, if you have treated patients, then there would be several grades of response. The grades of remission, grade 1 will be where the patient is not on acetylcholine esterase inhibitors like pyridostigmate. He is not on any immunosuppressant and he is asymptomatic. Grade 2 will be patient is asymptomatic on pyridostigmate. Grade 3 will be patient asymptomatic on immunomodulators and pyridostigmate. And grade 4 is patient symptomatic despite maximal immunosuppressant and maximum so these are the four grades of response. So our idea is to maintain most patients in grade one or grade two. So if a patient is on grade one or grade two, then you can <coughs> gradually taper off the immunosuppressant and keep the patient on symptomatic treatment or no treatment. But after thymectomy, the patient has to be on immunosuppressant for at least one year before we start tapering. And if the thymectomy is not being done or is not possible or the patient does not fall into that category, then at least give them immunosuppression for at least two and a half to three years before we start to taper the immunosuppressants. The symptomatic treatment has to be given as long as the patient is symptomatic. And we keep a tag on a possible relapse of myasthenia by doing uh, the acetylcholine receptor binding antibodies periodically every time we change or reduce one drug. So I think I am removing those. I'm not taking those questions which you have already answered in your presentation. Yes. Uh, why, uh, hmm, why is more predilection of a central like ocular or axial musculature more than appendicular like distal muscles. I've already answered this. Uh, yeah, this is also you have answered. Yeah. So what do you suggest as a role of physiotherapy in myasthenia? Physiotherapy is not to be done in myasthenia. It is something which we avoid and the only neurological condition when active physiotherapy is not needed. So what we do is a range of motion activity, which is the best which we can allow one. The second is chest physiotherapy and deep breathing exercises are extremely important. So all patients who have even minor uh, bulbar features should continue to do incentive respirometry. Patients who have been on the verge of recovery from myasthenic crisis and have been recently extubated should do very aggressive incentive uh, spirometry Aramanjali. and a chest physiotherapy. Okay. VATS versus open thymectomy. Yes, we had done this trial and <coughs> we had, I think, published this data in JAPI. JAPI, yes. So we found that uh, there was actually no difference between the two groups. Worldwide also, there is no difference between the two groups. But if we compare uh, bit, the difference between VATS and robotic thymectomy, then robotic thymectomy is much, much more superior than uh, VATS thymectomy. It is almost like open thymectomy. So if you have to choose between the three groups, it will depend upon the surgeon, not the person. 
so if a robotic surgeon is confident that he can remove every single milligram of thymic tissue by robotic surgery offer a robotic thymectomy but if you don't have one or if you have a non confident one then it is best to go for a open thymectomy because videoscopic thymectomy would be somewhere in between over a period of time uh, our group had achieved such a uh, you know tremendous confidence on uh, non invasive thymectomy that we used to have at least 2 to 3 patients in waiting every single week for thymectomy in the chest unit at teams so i am seeing some familiar faces in the audience as well dr dash is there who is actually yes i can see he yeah, uh, aims and now presently in director in portus gurgaon sir can you hear us sir sir ko mute unmute karna padega sir ko karna padega but i am not finding sir here actually aap na sir is there ha ye sir hai na sir you want to comment on anything sir no no it is really very nice and extensive discourse on myasthenia gravis congratulations thank, thank you sir thank you thank you sir. yeah dr prasanna is here from jipmer sir uh, he is a nation professor in neuroanesthesia in jipmer so in neuro he can if he can unmute his mic and ask something if is any uh, query regarding myasthenia no 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 excellent one everything is covered uh, very well so this is uh, this was third or fourth lecture as a part of series which we are covering in neurocritical care thank you very much sir for coming and making it a grand success So it was excellent one my pleasure thank you very much so yeah so most of the things have been covered sir if there are anything which is there i think there is one or two more questions that people have just now posted so if you use rituximab for myasthenia in the acute phase do you maintain that on rituximab or transition for them to azathioprine to 6 months later okay uh, there was there is one trial which has been published by the aims group it is a retrospective analysis of about 14 cases so it's not a prospective study and it is probably the only of its kind which i could find so what they have done is they have evaluated the need for repeated infusions for rituximab so they have drawn a conclusion that rituximab might not be required like other neurological disorders to be given in repeated infusions so what you can do is that to induce the the uh, the remission you give rituximab repeat it after 6 months and then you might not need to repeat it over time after you have given the first set of rituximab you start on alternative immunosuppression like azathioprine in 2 to 3 months azathioprine will take its good effect the second rituximab will be a sort of a booster and then you might not require it life long okay i think most of the things we have covered but regarding non invasive ventilation sir what we do in our icu is that if the patient has been admitted earlier before exhaustion we tend to see it's it's it depends on how the patient is doing see intubation there might be many criteria but the best criteria is if the anesthetist is thinking that patient needs an intubation patient needs an intubation so uh, as regards non invasive ventilation we have an experience and but we generally end up intubating those patients so my advice will be intubate early as you have already told that in the lecture and non invasive ventilation uh, maybe a very early disease or a very mild kind of a myasthenic crisis uh, most of the patients who are actually going deep into the crisis they require an intubation absolutely no i what i said was niv has no role after intubation that is what i meant so we generally when we extubate we generally put the patient on non invasive ventilation also absolutely you really don't absolutely clean them straight away absolutely ha uh, we straight away don't just extubate the patient most of the patient after extubation also have a uh, chances of uh, failure reintubation is very likely in these patients so we That's use non invasive bipap ventilation in these patients very frequently so, uh, what is the about the timing of tracheostomies so the Should think you are the best for two weeks two weeks or three weeks people have been 
keeping the patients intubated for two weeks because they know that this is going to reverse. So, but in our institution, we generally see the effects for around fifth day, fifth or sixth day of IV IG, and we generally then uh, go for a tracheostomy. We prefer an early tracheostomy in these patients. Anybody from the audience who just wanted to come in and say something about a tracheostomy? Dr. Prasanna? Yeah, I think Keshav is there. Keshav? Oh, I think that uh, as you said earlier also that uh, uh, this earlier tracheostomy should be preferred. One thing I wanted to just ask, sir, the, what, what about the autonomic dysfunctions if these patients are having? Then how do we go about it? There was one, uh, there were two or three publications uh, by Dr. Ahuja. And this was way back in 1900 and I think 82, 83, where he uh, evaluated uh, the autonomic dysfunctions uh, in myasthenia gravis. We also did a trial of, uh, uh, you know, sympathetic skin response in myasthenia gravis. And we were surprised to find that 40% of patients with myasthenia will have autonomic dysfunction. So we all see when the ball comes in our court, how to manage it. So the most common problem which we will see is uh, usually a tachycardia, bradycardia syndrome. And sometimes uh, you will have a fluctuating hypertensive response. So these are the two things which are, will be managed best by a critical care team. But otherwise, uh, they would have a postural hypotension, but this is usually seen after recovery. So these are the three main responses which we see. So this is what we see. Uh, we generally uh, treat it with fluids. And another thing is there can be a pseudo hyponatremia in these patients. Which is which is there? I think that that also you have covered in your presentation. So that's the most comprehensive presentation. I think everything was covered. Sir, it was so extensive. Very well. <laughs> we like to hear it uh, some after six months again. <laughs> <laughs> most most welcome anytime. I I love uh, to speak on my Yeah, the last time I spoke. There were about 350 attendees from across the country and it continued. I uh, had a presentation for two hours. I uh, also reviewed thymectomy in great detail in that trial because it was only for the neurologists. This one was focused on neurocritical. Therefore, I tailored it for that. Uh, okay, sir. I think I should end it here only. Yes. And thanks for I, this extensive presentation. Once thank again. you very much. And thanks uh, for thank everyone to be such a patient listener. Thank, thank you very you. much. Have a thank great you. day and uh, a lovely Sunday.